I'm Karen Hollis, the Director of the Concentration in Writing and Rhetoric, and uh, I'd like to welcome you to Pulitzer Prize Week and our opening keynote address by Eileen Sullivan, our uh, uh, impressive Villanova grad who, as you all know, won a Pulitzer Prize um, for her series with the AP on uh, spying in the Muslim community by the New York Police Department. Um, so again, her work, I think, for the Associated Press and, and for the, the field of journalism in general is, is so very important. Uh, the, the, the profession has been you know, singled out, mentioned in our Constitution as crucial to our democracy. And again, we're very proud of Eileen because she's right there making this contribution known and making a difference in our national life. and. Uh, Assuring that our de democracy uh, is, our people are well informed and uh, that we're making our decisions uh, based on accurate information. Um, and, you know, the, the importance of that, I don't think, can be overstated. Um, we, uh, we have a, a full week here. Um, in addition to Eileen, we have uh, Pulitzer Prize winning reporters from the Philadelphia Inquirer coming. and. Um, we have a, key, a closing keynote on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock in uh, the Villanova Cinema Conley Center. And all week long, between 3 and 5 o'clock, we have workshops. Eileen gave a wonderful workshop today filled with so much wisdom that I'm amazed that she has gathered in her young life already. Very inspiring. Same thing from the Philadelphia Inquirer reporters. Um, who did their series on violence in the Philadelphia public school system. And in addition to the reporters, we have 15 reporters that worked on this team that are coming to Villanova giving the workshops. Uh, we also had the principal of the South Philadelphia High School um, that was the subject of much of the, their series. He allowed the Philadelphia Inquirer reporter to embed uh, daily for almost a year at his school to really observe firsthand uh, how, how things were going there and all the problems. And he was, uh, a, again, another inspiration, a really um, committed professional educator. So not only are we seeing the best of the journalists, but we've also seen some, uh, an educator who's very inspiring. I was glad we were, being, we were able to give them a, a podium and a, a uh, an audience here at Villanova, and um, again, very, very thankful that they would come, that many of them. Um, also, coincidentally, this week we have a play, a pri Pulitzer Prize winning play, uh, How I Learned to Drive, uh, being produced by the Villanova Theater. It's uh, starting tomorrow night at 8 o'clock, and I have some flyers uh, on the ledge up there if anybody would like to know more about it. Um, so let's see, I need to thank some people, of course. Um, first of all, of course, the, the professionals in journalism and education that have so generously given their time to students and faculty at Villanova. I also want to thank my two devoted coordinators, co-coordinators of Pulitzer Prize Week, Jody Ross of the English Department, and she's advisor to the Villanova and inspiring students herself to become professional journalists. And uh, Tom Kizak of the Communication Department, both of them were in the trenches with me doing lots of things to pull this all together. Uh, Tom will be introducing the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, uh, Dr. Jean Ann Lenny. And again, from the beginning of our idea to have Pulitzer Prize Week, uh, Dean Lenny was an enthusiastic supporter. Thank you very much. And so I'll turn it over to Tom for a minute. Eileen, it's really great that, that you could come back to us at Villanova and, and speak with us. As I want to second Karen's comments about this afternoon. For those, <clears throat> I see a lot of familiar faces of students who were there this afternoon, and you know as well as I, it's really a wonderful workshop. Um, I actually want to just take a moment to thank our sponsors uh, for Villanova Pulitzer Week. Um, and it is a long list, so give me a minute here. Uh, the Concentration in Writing and Rhetoric, the Waterhouse, in the Waterhouse Family Institute, uh, for the Study of Communication and Society, the Department of English, the Department of Communication, the Center for Peace and Justice Education, the Cultural Studies Program, the Department of Education and Counseling, Falvey Library, and the Writing Center. Really is an impressive list. Karen and I were just joking that uh, nobody wanted to say no when we came asking. Uh, but I, honestly, that, that really speaks to the value of ha having somebody like Eileen come back to us. 
Um, and of course, I also want to thank Dean Linney um, for her, her avid support right from the beginning um, of putting this great week together. Um, so now it's my pleasure to introduce Dean Linney, who will uh, tell you a little bit about our keynote speaker. Thank you all. Let me say good evening to everyone. Um, as Tom said, I'm Dr. Jean Ann Lenny. Um, for those of you that don't recognize me, I've been here a year, and um, it's been a fantastic year, and I remember the day that I got the notice that one of the graduates from the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences had won a Pulitzer Prize, and it's like, this is what every dean wants to get, so thank you for giving me this in my first year. I, um, I'm really delighted to welcome you all to, to this event and to this week-long celebration of the power of critical thinking and writing, which is really what this is all about. Critical thinking and writing are the pillars of a liberal arts education and, and, and something we talk about extensively at Villanova University. Um, <clears throat> I want to tell you a little bit about Eileen Sullivan. As you know, she's a Villanova graduate, class of 1999. She was part of the honors program, and you've already heard that she wrote for the Villanovan. She currently works for the Associated Press in Washington, D.C. When Eileen graduated from Villanova, she went to work for the Courier Post newspaper in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Um, she covered municipal government issues for Camden and Burlington counties. I can't, you know, I'm guessing that in 1999, Camden and Burlington County municipal issues were not terribly exciting, but clearly they were important in, in Eileen's um, start. So after four years there, she moved to Washington, D.C. She's originally from Alexandria, uh, Virginia, just outside of D.C. And um, in the Washington area, she began to cover homeland security issues as a reporter both for the Federal Times and the Congressional Quarterly. In 2007, she joined the Associated Press covering national security and counterterrorism issue, issues. And in 2012, she was recognized with the Pulitzer Prize for excellence in investigative reporting. So Eileen, along with three colleagues from the AP, investigated secret intelligence operations that were set up by the New York Police Department after 9-11. Um, the, the NYPD had set up a program that was monitoring the daily life in, in Muslim communities. Resulted, this investigative reporting resulted in congressional calls for a federal investigation and a very significant debate over the proper role of domestic intelligence gathering. I, um, I want to welcome Eileen's parents, um, Tim and Marsha Sullivan as well, and, um, and Eileen's friend, Jim Lambert, who helped us to um, turn on the system here. <laughs> I, um, I hope that you'll all be able to stay to, um, to ask questions and to learn everything that you can from a very distinguished Villanova alum, Eileen. Thank you so much. Let me get mic'd up here. Does that, does that work? Yes. Um, so thank you. This is three really nice introductions, and I'm definitely not used to this because in Washington, when people introduce me, they say, watch out, she's a reporter, and then <laughs> I have to take it from there. So for the journalism students here, get ready for those kinds of nice introductions in your future. Um, but it's such an honor to be kicking off Pulitzer Week. You guys have quite a lineup this week with the sessions with the Philadelphia Inquirer reporters who did the wonderful Pulitzer winning series on violence in the Philadelphia School District. And I just can't tell you how lucky you are to do these workshops with them. I would have loved to have had this opportunity when I was sitting where you're sitting. And honestly, I would like to do it now. I mean, you're, there's just still so much to learn from good journalists, but I have to be back in Washington tomorrow. So I, it's been a long time since I've been back on campus. It looks very different. Uh, it's uh, nine years almost. and. Um, I just have so many wonderful memories here. I have an old roommate sitting here. It's so nice to see her. She looks exactly the same. And um, I would spend my Wednesday and Thursday nights working at the Villanovan. And we, um, I mean, at the time, I knew I wanted to be a reporter, but that was about it. You know, the one, the one thing I was supposed to do 
to pursue that when I got to college was to join the newspaper, and I did that. But that, you know, that was about it. And um, I can honestly say that winning the Pulitzer Prize never crossed my mind during my four years here. And I, I certainly, you know, I, I read the wonderful series that Villanova grad Diana Suggs wrote. Um, she won in 2003 for her series in the Baltimore Sun about complex medical issues told through the eyes of uh, patients and families. And it's worth going back and reading, and that's what, what makes it such a special series. Um, so that's, um, I, it's, and as you guys mentioned, I was working at the Curry Post uh, when I first graduated from college. And so when she won the Pulitzer for beat reporting in 2003, I was a beat reporter covering Camden, New Jersey. And um, a lot has changed in my life since then, although from what I hear, Camden is almost the same. So that's a really quick way to bring you to the present day. And I'm here tonight because in April, my colleagues at the Associated Press, Matt Apuzo, Adam Goldman, and Chris Hawley and I won the Pulitzer Prize for investigative reporting for a series that we did on the New York Police Department and their tactics since 9-11 to counter terrorism, which involved a lot of infiltrating Muslim neighborhoods. And I don't need to tell you all how significant the 9-11 attacks were. We lost 15 Villanovans that day. And I wrote extensively about 1993 Villanova grad Danielle Kasoulis. She was on the 104th floor of the North Tower. She was working for Canner Fitzgerald. And her family is from a town that I covered in South Jersey. So I, you know, was, I, I worked with her family for the years that I was at The Courier and got to know Danielle so much that, uh, you know, I wished I had the opportunity to know her when she was alive. So after 9-11, the government wanted to do everything it could to make sure nothing like 9-11 would happen again. And federal agencies were reorganized, eliminated, in some cases invented. New laws were written, money was being thrown at local police and firefighters to you know, purchase equipment that could protect them in case of the worst. And um, agencies who weren't working together to share intelligence were under strict orders to do so. And I mean, now we have so much intelligence being shared. Um, it's, you almost get lost looking through it. And in the midst of all of that, a new relationship formed between the CIA and the New York Police Department. And the NYPD, like so many Americans and New Yorkers, never wanted 9-11 to happen again. And the way to do this, they determined, was to restructure their intelligence division. And in order to do that, they brought in the nation's former top spy to run the programs. And David Cohen spent 35 years at the CIA. He ran the agency's analytical and operational divisions. And after 9-11, he would have a senior position in the New York Police Department, America's largest police department. But Cohen had no police experience. And the rules for what the CIA can do overseas are wildly different from what local police departments can do in the US. But that blend of foreign spycraft and domestic policing led to the most aggressive local, ta local counterterrorism operation in the country. In 2011, my Washington colleagues, Matt Apuzo and Adam Goldman, they're on the investigative team in Washington, they were writing stories about the CIA. And they're just this great team of talent. Uh, they're anyone who know, meets them doesn't forget them. And they build sources better than anyone I've ever met. If someone doesn't take their calls, they just drive to their homes and knock on the door and find a way in. And um, it was during the course of these stories that they were reporting on the CIA that the you know, they started hearing things about the NYPD's intelligence division. And everyone in the counterterrorism world since 9-11, so reporters like me, police from other places in the country, other, you know, federal law enforcement, we all knew that the NYPD had this very robust program. We all knew that other federal agencies complained about it. Um, but that was really about it. And as, you know, a Washington port reporter, the NYPD wasn't something that I was digging into every day. So, People that Matt and Adam were talking to after, you know, during the course of the interviews, they would say things like, do you know, do you know the term rakers? Have you heard of mosque crawlers? And these are two guys who pride themselves on knowing every term in the intelligence world. And so these are two that they didn't know. So they wanted to find out. And so as they were interviewing people for other stories, they would say, hey, by the way, do you know what a mosque crawler is? Do you know what a raker is? And um, so we learned, and um, we learned that a raker 
is an undercover police officer sent into places where Muslims lived, ate, and worshipped to rake the coals looking for hotspots. And a hotspot could be a beauty supply store selling chemicals that could be used for making bombs, an internet cafe where a computer's browser history has, you know, shows a, an extremist website that someone in the cafe had been frequenting, or an ethnic bookstore that sold radical literature. And um, if a restaurant patron applauded a news report, you know, on the TV about um, a U.S. troop's death, the patron or the restaurant could be labeled a hotspot. A mosque crawler was a police informant who monitored weekly sermons and reported what was said. And if the FBI were to do this, they would be in violation of the Federal Privacy Act, which prohibits the federal government from collecting intelligence on purely First Amendment activities. So I've covered counterterrorism since 2004. I've written stories about how local police departments are trying to attack this, you know, this counterterrorism mission, this intelligence-led policing. It's, it's a different way of policing. You're trying to prevent something from happening instead of responding to something that's already happened. I've written about how the Obama administration encourages local police departments to reach out to the Muslim community to learn about them, to build relationships and build trust. And I've written extensively about the delicate balance of giving up privacy and civil liberty um, for safety, which is a topic that, that's come up a lot since 9-11. So Matt and Adam came to me early on and said, you know, have you heard of rakers or moss crawlers, and do you know if any other police departments are doing this? And I said, absolutely not. So we realized this was something we needed to pursue further. The practices were so atypical for American municipal police departments. In fact, there was a huge gap between what the NYPD was doing and what the Obama administration was telling local police to do as far as best practices. And so here I am seeing what NYPD is doing, and at the same time, I'm covering the Obama administration saying, this is how you do it, and there's just, you know, they never mentioned the NYPD, but it seemed that it, they did not want them using those tactics. So it's not that what the NYPD was doing is illegal, because it's not. So far, no court has ruled that it's illegal. But it was something that the public should have an opportunity to discuss, because like I said, it's so atypical. It was yet another example of Americans giving up their own privacy rights for security. So after lots of reporting, we soon had a description of the NYPD's intelligence division that no one else beside those on the inside had seen. The NYPD secretly took notes on sermons in mosques. They wrote down where Muslims ate and shopped and went to school. They snuck into Muslim student groups on college campuses, took note of flyers of events, and secretly attended club outings. The NYPD wanted to map the city's human terrain. The program was modeled in part on how Israeli authorities operate in the West Bank. So soon the story about the NYPD's intelligence division became the stories of people coming to America in search of a better life for themselves and their families. People who, like so many of us, work, send money home to family members, and don't break any, law, any laws. People who strive to become part of America the way so many of our families have done for decades. So I just want to show you a couple of these people that we talked to. And this is Leo Santini. He is a cafe owner and US citizen in Queens. After he moved to the US from Morocco, he changed his name from Mohammed Hussein because he thought he would be treated better if he didn't have such an Arabic sounding name. He said his three kids look American, so they, sh you know, they shouldn't have any problem growing up here. And I met Santini because his restaurant was listed in an NY NYPD report called the Moroccan Initiative. This is his restaurant. This is the report. And this was a secret NYPD program designed to catalog life inside Moroccan neighborhoods in New York as people immigrated, got jobs, became citizens, and started businesses. Undercover officers snapped photographs of restaurants frequented by Moroccans, including one that was noted for serving religious Muslims. Police documented where Moroccans bought groceries, which hotels they visited, and where they prayed. While visiting an apartment used by new Moroccan immigrants, an officer noted in his reports that he saw two Korans and a calendar from a nearby mosque. That would be like police noting that you have two Bibles in your dorm room and a mass schedule. The information was recorded in NYPD computers so that if police ever received a specific tip about a Moroccan terrorist, they, could, they would know exactly where to go in the Moroccan community to look for them. And why Moroccans? In 2003, there were suicide bombings in Casablanca where 45 people were, ki were killed. 
and in the 2004 train bombing in Madrid was linked to Moroccan terrorists. So that's why the Moroccan community in New York was targeted. The NYPD had no specific information about a threat coming from that community, but they became a target of surveillance nonetheless. This is Sheikh Reda Shada. He's the subject of a 2007 Pulitzer Prize winning series in the New York Times about Muslims in America. The, the, the series is great and it, you know, he talks about what it's like to adjust to a new country, you know, lead this, um, his, his mosque in, in the community and work with, you know, just basically assimilate into America. So over the months in 2006 that the Times reporter was interviewing Shada, he was also being watched by an undercover officer and an informant and two others were assigned to watch his Brooklyn mosque. This man was in fact one of the leaders in New York who you know, is considered a partner in terrorism, everyone, in, or in counterterrorism. Um, he publicly decried terrorism and he cooperated with the police and dined with Mayor Michael Bloomberg. He welcomed F FBI agents to his mosque to speak to Muslims. He invited NYPD officers for breakfast and he threw parties for officers who were leaving the precinct. As police secretly watched him in 2006 for suspected terrorism ties, Shada had breakfast and dinner with Mayor Bloomberg at Gracie Mansion, and he was invited to meet with the NYPD police commissioner. Shada was singled out in an NYPD file for his threat potential and what the NYPD considered links to organizations associated with terrorism. Shada has never been charged with any crime. And I met Shada where he currently works, at the Islamic Center of Monmouth County in Middletown, New Jersey. I showed him where his name appeared in an NYPD police file. At first, he thought it was silly, because Mayor Bloomberg, he considered him a friend. By the end of our interview, after he saw the files and his name in it and his mosque in it, he said to me, this is very sad. He said, what is your feeling if you see this about people you trusted? This is Imam Shamsi Ali. He's a Muslim leader in New York who meets frequently with the mayor and police commissioner, and he's often pictured with them at public events. Uh, and in 2006, the NYPD infiltrated two mosques where he held leadership roles. The NYPD cited in their reports radical rhetoric and possible money laundering as the reason they were looking at him. They said the other one uh, was a hub of radicalization that offered martial arts training. When I showed Shamsi Ali the police files that listed his mosques, he asked me, how do you define rhetoric? And he said, if the police suspected money laundering, they should have called the Internal Revenue Service. But he said he wasn't surprised to learn that police were secretly listening inside his mosques. He said everywhere he goes, he feels like someone is listening to him. But he said he follows the law, and so he has nothing to hide. In April of last year, more than 100 New York area imams joined together and supported this rally to oppose wars, condemn terrorism, and fight Islamophobia. Of those imams who were publicly decrying terrorism, more than 30 were either identified by name or work in mosques that were included in the NYPD's 2006 listing of suspicious people and places. This is students on a college campus. So college campuses in New York, including Columbia University and well outside the city, like Yale University, were not immune from the spying either. Yale is about as close to New York as it is, as New York is to Philadelphia, to give you a sense of how far they were going. So NYPD detectives trawled Muslim student websites daily and recorded names in police files. The NYPD recruited informants on college campuses and undercover officers infiltrated student groups. Why student groups? Because some known terror suspects had been in Muslim student associations when they were in college. From this, NYPD listed ancestries of interest. So this is, this is what they're interested in looking at, you know, looking into these people's communities to see if there's any uh, suspected terrorism. And um, one stood out to us, this ancestry, the American black Muslim. We hadn't heard that one before. So we're not sure where, where that came from. But many of the immigrants from these ancestries came from countries where the police are the enemy. But that's what American community-oriented policing is designed to avoid. Because when police are seen as the enemy, municipal policing breaks down. But the NYPD to this day still stands by its practices. 
The department spokesman said, the New York Police Department is doing everything it can to make sure that there's not another 9-11 here and that more innocent New Yorkers are not killed by terrorists. He said, and we have nothing to apologize for in that regard. Yet our reporting showed a pattern of equating religious practice, practicing Islam, with suspicious behavior. The way the NYBT has been targeting ethnic communities since 9-11 would violate civil liberties if done so by the federal government. The New York City Council, which funds the department, and the federal government, which provides millions of dollars each year to the police department, is never told exactly what's going on. If this was a federal agency that had congressional oversight, your members of Congress would be demanding information from them. They would be calling hearings on Capitol Hill, asking for details, maybe even subpoenaing to get information. But Congress, despite calls from some lawmakers to investigate, believes it does not have the authority to look into the NYPD because it's a municipal police department. And some members feel that there's nothing that the NYPD is doing that's wrong. And so far, no court has ruled that the NYPD intelligence division practices are illegal. In fact, plenty of people, plenty of New Yorkers, have no issue with the NYPD infiltrating Muslim communities to prevent terrorism. The important part, though, is that we told people about this. And now the public can decide if this is OK. And so that's our job today as reporters. It was the press's job in the 1970s, and the same job will need to be done 30 years from now. What will be different in the future is going to be the tools we use to report and how the public gets those stories. Newspapers are becoming thinner and thinner. During the 13 years I've been a reporter, newsroom staffs have been cut to the bare bones. Today, a Pulitzer Prize winner reporter who you will meet this week at the Philadelphia Inquirer is getting ready to take an unpaid vacation because the paper is in such financial straits. So, of course, we should be worried about news organizations cutting back and laying people off not just for our own livelihoods, but for the sake of delivering the news. <coughs> Society will always need an objective accounting of what is happening. But the fact that people like this Inquirer reporter are writing important stories that the public might never have known about without them, and the fact that people are reading these stories and recognizing them, tells me that our profession is still going strong and must have a future. We'll be continuing to see new ways just to tell the stories, and we're going to need to keep up with the changes. When I started at the Courier Post in 1999, there was one computer with the internet that I was allowed to use if necessary. It was in the library. But it wasn't long before we got the internet on all of our computers. And I have no idea how I would do my job today without the internet. I don't, I mean, I don't know where a phone book is. It's just, there's, you can't do your job without the internet. So other platforms like social networking have become what the internet was to newsrooms in 1999. We've all finally got it, and we're trying to figure out how to use it. And by the time you aspiring journalists are working in a newsroom, you won't give a second thought to using Twitter as part of your job. It's part of how you live your life now, and it will be just, you know, it'll just happen naturally how you do your job. And you won't be thinking about it as a new iteration of how we deliver the news. I never thought twice about the telephone when I first started out, but the phone must have been a game changer to the reporter of the early 1900s. We've gotten to a point where the print reporter needs to be the broadcast guy, the photographer, and the producer of online content. More and more reporters my age have been diversifying their skills so that they can remain a critical part of the profession. Now a reporter can cover a meeting, take pictures on her cell phone, post them to the internet, and email the story and pictures to her editor for the next day's publication. That's all happening at once. But good reporters don't become defined by their medium. So those of you going into the profession, don't pigeonhole yourself as a good social media reporter or a good multimedia reporter. Otherwise, you'll find yourself as, an anti as antiquated as the guy who says he specializes in telephone reporting. So the industry is going to have to figure out a way to make money off of all of this. And um, that's, that's been the problem. They have to figure it out so, so that you, know, you guys can take in the enormous salary I am taking in or that I would like to take in. Um, and that continues to be difficult. But I recently read uh, in the Columbia Journalism Review magazine about a new venture in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It's a multi-platform startup called This Land Press. It has only 11 full-time employees on the editorial side, and it produces in-depth, locally-focused stories and investigations. According to this article, This Land produces content on paper, video, online, and audio. 
Its focus is on a good story and not the news of the day. And it is able to tell the story in several different ways. CJR says this land is on track to earn mo more money than it spends. That is a concept today in journalism. <laughs> it's so nice to hear, though. Good stories, good journalism, delivered in multiple formats, can make money. So I guess the answer is we need to move to Tulsa. <laughs> but the important part is that we keep reporting and we keep holding the government accountable for what it does. For those of you who plan to go into this field, you will undoubtedly be told over and over, no comment, no you can't have that because it's classified, no you can't come to this meeting, no you have it wrong, no you can't publish that, no, no, and no. In many cases you may never hear yes, but you have to keep trying. You have to keep looking for other ways to get information, whether it's through public records requests or conversations with people who might have a sliver of a detail of what you're looking for. You just have to keep asking questions. That's how we wrote the NYPD series. The police department didn't exactly open its doors to us. And um, despite Commissioner Kelly and my shared Irish ancestry, I'm pretty sure I'm not on his Christmas list this year, <laughs> Christmas card list this year. But because of our stories years from now, people will look back on the reaction to 9-11 and see how Muslims were treated in New York. People can decide if this is how the US should prevent terrorism whatever the threat is in the future. And people are indeed having these conversations. They're having them in Washington, in New York, in classrooms, at kitchen tables, and all over the internet. During a four hour car ride with my parents last year, I had a front row seat to the, a slice of the national debate on the NYPD policies. One parent was for the tactics and one was against it. And I'm thinking, wow, the Associated Press did this. We, we gave them something to argue about. That's, <laughs> That's great, I just wish it wasn't a four hour car ride. <laughs> um, but that's our job as reporters. We report the facts so that the public has the opportunity to come to their own conclusions. And that job won't always win you awards. In fact, most of the time it won't. But that doesn't make what you do any less important. And the next generation of journalists, you guys, are critically needed to get that, those stories out and arm people with the facts and give my parents something new to argue about. So, thank you. In the Baltimore Sun? Yeah, in the Baltimore Sun. And when was this? In about five years ago. Okay, I, I don't know. She knew about it very well, and she said before she won the Pulitzer Prize, that series was one of the five finalists. Is that right? They have five finalists for the Pulitzer Prize? I think so. Anyway, the series was about Battalion 316. Battalion 316 is a unit of the Honduran Armed Forces. It was created by the American ambassador to Honduras, John Negro Ponte, and its main job was to disappear or torture critics of the Honduran government, criticizing them because the Honduran government allowed the Americans to take over Honduran land and create the Contras to terrorize Nicaragua. You probably haven't read it, but if those facts are true, would you consider our ambassador to Nicaragua, John Negro Ponce, a terrorist? I don't see how it can be avoided. And yet, George W. Bush made him ambassador to the UN. Um, I, I don't know enough about the series, um, but it's very interesting. I'm going to certainly read it. OK, because you're an expert on terrorism, I recommend that you read it. And Thank you. Sometime, maybe, think over whether Okay, I will think about that. Um, amid the financial struggles that newspapers across the country are having, have you seen the AP shrink their investigative unit? Um, 
No, not really. And the reason, and I think this is a great example of, of why. I mean, the AP, we have teams of investigative reporters, but then they're also able to pull on beat reporters like me, so who are you know, going to work on an investigation. And because we have such a wide swath of talent all over the world, we're able to sort of you know, force multiply for the investigative units. And it's really, it's, it's a big priority for us, and it's great, you know, the, winning the Pulitzer is wonderful, but what's really great is that people see that the, and that, you know, the AP does stories like the NYPD series, and uh, I can tell you we're working on, on more. go to the internet. Yeah, you go to the internet and you start Googling and you look for people who, I mean, LinkedIn is a great tool if you guys haven't figured out how to use it because you can do specific searches for, you know, keywords in the search and then you can click a box that says, you know, former or current. So then you see, oh, this person used to work at NYPD. Give them a call, see what they know and they might tell you three other people to call. So it's a lot of you know, getting out, asking people. Um, law enforcement, in particular, talks to each other a lot. So there were, you know, well, you know, this program wasn't exactly public. People knew about it. They knew people involved with it. And um, to your question about the documents, that was um, after our first story ran, we had an email just an AP, invest, AP Washington, D.C. investigations um, address. And um, at the time, the NYPD said that this unit that we wrote about, the demographics unit, didn't exist. It just you know, didn't exist. And so we get a document that says, demographics unit, <laughs> 16 <laughs> officers speaking these languages. And it was, uh, it was great. Um, so we were able then to not only report that story, but post the document. And I talked a little bit about this today. I mean, we. All the documents we got, we validated were actual police documents because we, you have to be careful that you're not being set up, um, that someone's not trying to get you to report something that's not true. So we, the more people we met and spoke to, we got more documents and we also got them anonymously. And um, we posted, I mean, we're very careful. We looked at all the names. We talked to many people to make sure that we weren't sort of jeopardizing any ongoing investigations with anything that we published. Uh, but we posted them on the internet so people could see. And uh, I think Gawker at one point did a, there was, they, they posted, NYPD did, they infiltrated New York neighborhoods and um, listed all these restaurants. And I think Gawker did like a restaurant review based off of, <laughs> of that report. Um, Cause it does, it reads like a restaurant review. It is, it is very difficult, and when it's about building trust. And so when you meet someone who's you know, really nervous about talking to you and potentially losing their job, I mean, you, you have to assure them that you won't and um, that you know, you know, you're going to be discreet about this, but they've never met you. I mean, you, you need to know someone in order to trust them. So sometimes it just doesn't happen on the first try. Sometimes you'll see a person a couple times and they, you might get comfortable seeing your face or something like that. And what I say to sources is that, you know, look, the reason I will never burn you is the most selfish reason of all because that will ruin my career. I will, I will not have you to tell me what I need to know. So I know you're worried about you, but think about it in, in very selfish terms. I will not burn you because that really hurts me in what I do. And, you know, I just feel that that's, you know, 
it makes people feel better to know that you know you're not just out there without any sort of stake in this, and to see that this is, you know, you're you're going to protect them at whatever length. Did that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good. We start with one story. Um, you can. I mean, if, you, if you're interviewing someone and sometimes the only time to do it is over an email, let's say I was just emailing with someone who was in Libya last week, I mean, we're not going to get on the phone um, at that point. So you can quote them over if it's an email. As long as you set up the, the terms in advance, you know, let them know that this is information that you're going to use on the record uh, just so that they know what's to be expected. Um, did you tour the AP's New York offices? Yeah. Okay, that was, we were up there and I had to catch a train back, but Matt had asked me to do that with you guys, so hopefully it was fun. <laughs> Anyone? Yes. You know, I don't know. <laughs> when the media gets blamed for a lot, right? Um, there's, I don't know, I, one of the reasons I love working for the Associated Press is that we're such a straight down the middle organization and objective and we're, it's, it's facts only, it's not opinions and um, so we sort of have a brand, not sort of, but we do, we have this brand that people trust and you know, the media all gets lumped together, um, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of new ways to get out stories and there were. 10 years ago, um, but that's, I mean, I see that, you know, that's a real value in still having official news organizations like the Associated Press who have accredited journalists and who are, you know, there's checks and balances with editors and fact checking and we get in trouble when we get stuff wrong. I mean, that's just not what you want to do. <laughs> so. Not that we know of. I mean, some of their policies. Sorry, I'll, I'll, the, the, a lot of the documents we had were from you know 2006, 2007, 2008. So some of the stuff I you know talked to people. They said well, we don't do that anymore because it didn't work, or just you know we just didn't see it, and um, it just didn't make sense to. You know, we weren't getting anything out of putting people on you know imams 24/7 and watching them. So some they had rolled back some of the policies before our story or, you know, and, and maybe even some during, uh, just because they felt that they weren't working, but the, they've not renounced anything. They're defending, they're defending their programs and, you know, holding up as a model to be replicated if necessary. Um, I was bugging that editor all the time, <laughs> making sure that she saw my stuff. Um, I, you know, when I was at Villanova, I wasn't like, you know, I really want to work for the Associated Press. I didn't really know much about it. I knew the AP in South Jersey because I knew the reporter who I competed with, and I knew that the AP would sometimes, you know, pick up stories that I did. Um, and you know that's what we do. We we credit the newspaper, but they'll they'll do pickups. And um, in Washington, I just I knew the Homeland Security reporter for the AP while I was working at Congressional Quarterly, so I got to know her a little bit. And they were hiring, and I had actually been in touch with the Washington bureau chief when I was in Camden through a family friend said, "Hey, I, you know, my son plays on a soccer team with this woman. I think she's kind of a big deal at AP, and 
she was a big deal at EP, and she gave me really great advice as I was leaving Camden and throughout my time in Washington while I wanted to get back to a mainstream publication because I was working for two inside Washington publications. And so she, particularly when I was getting really frustrated, I mean, I was at Congressional Quarterly at this point and you know, I wasn't getting hired. And so I said to her, what do I do? And she said, look, CQ is not a bad place to ride out the storm. And that really made me think, you know what? That's what I'm gonna do. And I am going to make sure that I break stories from my beat here. And it was actually a great little situation because we had had a new editor for this particular publication, which was, it's for Congress. I mean, that's, that's our main audience. And um, I was, all of a sudden had developed some really great sources and was getting some really great material that was perfect for the AP, not necessarily CQ, but this editor didn't really, you know, he was still learning how to do this. So got to a point where I said, I have this story, let's post it online right now, because I wanted the timestamp online so that I could send it to the bureau chief saying, I beat your reporter with this. So, I mean, <laughs> you, <laughs> desperate times, desperate members, right? So I don't know, I mean, if I hadn't had, the, if that editor was more seasoned at CQ, would have said, this is not a story for AP. This is, or sorry, for CQ, this is a story for the Associated Press, this is a story for, for someone else. But I, um, I lucked out there, I guess. <laughs> it took me a while to figure out I lucked out with that editor. But once I got hired, um, it was great. And it's just been such an incredible experience. I mean, really working with talented, talented people who are, you know, not just such great role models, but so supportive of what you do. I mean, we're all really, I've, I've heard stories about sort of what it's like in some newsrooms, and it's just not like that in ours. Um, it just happens that Matt, Adam, and I are, you know, really close friends, so that makes it easier. It also sometimes makes it harder when we get frustrated with each other, but um, that helped, and we all live on Capitol Hill, so there were lots of nights when we were, you know, sharing documents and looking at this and looking at that, and particularly with the with the Shada story. I mean, I was up in New Jersey, like planes, trains, boats, automobiles. I could not. Get, I should have taken an automobile to. That was the lesson. But I took the train up, and it was just so hard to get to Middletown to get back, and I was exhausted. And I got into Union Station late, and Matt picked me up, and uh, we went to dinner, and Adam was there, and we talked about what I got and what the story would look like. And I mean, that's really nice. <laughs> I mean, it's still 11 o'clock at night, but we, um, that's, it's so great to be able to have those conversations. And, uh, and just also to be able to talk, the three of us are so different with the way we look at things and approach things that um, it was, I mean, that just, I think, brought so much to the story too. So it's great being part of a team. Sure. And how the AP makes money. Well, um, <laughs> so the AP is a wire service, and we our content goes out to people who pay for it. So, like news organizations, um, and also we have some online clients, uh, Yahoo, Google, I think, um, all over the world. So we say we have a billion readers, and um, that that's actually a really good little figure to have when you're trying to convince someone to give you the story first. <laughs> We just happen to have a billion readers all over the world. But, um, and it's, we do, um, we, as far as how it makes money, it has different services. So you can, you know, I think we make a lot of money off of our sports photography, which is something I know nothing about. But so there's just so much. I mean, we cover not just the news. Um, in Washington, obviously, we have reporters in bureaus around the country. And, and granted, those bureaus are, are a lot I mean, there are a lot fewer reporters there than there were 15 years ago, but they, they cover the state houses and, and the local stuff that's going on. We have reporters all over the world um, risking their own safety to be there, um, and photographers and videographers and people who do multimedia, so who, who put together all that stuff. And, um, but we're all, we're all journalists, so that's, that's nice. And um, I don't know, what else can I tell you? We, um, I, I mean, AP struggles when the newspapers struggle because we, they're our clients. So we've tried to help and reduce our rates for some of the papers over the years to try to help them deal with it. But I mean, 
it used to be there was like a wire service reporter at newspapers around the country. And um, a lot of papers don't have that anymore. I mean, I, th I think one of these stories, Matt called the, just cold called the newsroom and said, by the way, we're writing about an imam in your community. And it, oh, great, I'll look at the wire. And, you know, sure enough, front page, you know, but he had to make the call. And so it's, um, it's, it's sad, I mean, that, to think that, but we, you know, we've got our ways to, to get the message out. And um, we, people started, you know, and this was in New Jersey. I think the editors there really started to see that we were writing a lot about New Jersey. And so our stories got really great play there. I will go with the latter. Um, my dad <laughs> said to me, Eileen, you should really consider taking an economics class. And I said, just, you don't understand. I'm going to be a writer. You don't know. I'm not going to do that. I don't need that at all. And so I have to cover a municipal budget in my first job. I have to figure out what a public bond is and how I can get one. And, you know, it just, it was, I wish, sorry. <laughs> Would have been helpful, but also what would have been helpful is pre-law and pre-med, and I did take some poli science, but a little more of that. And I really think that you know I wasn't a journalism major; I didn't go to grad school, and so everyone thinks the way they did it is the best. So I think a strong liberal arts education is really important. But don't I mean I loved being an English major, and I you know wanted to take I'm sure a class in Virginia Woolf instead of economics. I mean without a doubt. But if you want to go into this. I've had so many moments where I was like, God, I wish I knew how the US court systems were. <laughs> um, this would be a real start. And because you don't, you are going to be writing about everything. I mean, really, it's just uh, the, the stuff that you have to learn, digest, and put back out so people can understand it. There are many moments where I wish I had taken a whole semester to have a little bit of background on that. Well, I, I heard an interview with Tom Brokaw about the time that he was, I guess, changing careers because he had doesn't feel like he's retired. But um, the argument was um, <clears throat> really against dedicated journalism schools, and and his argument was very much like yours that it's one thing to know how to write, but you have to be able to understand something about the topics that you're writing about. So whether it's the yeah. I mean, I, I don't have a tattoo, but if I were ever to get one, it would be the percent change formula <laughs> because <laughs> I have to do that so much. But fortunately, the internet has that for me. Um, <laughs> but it's, uh, I mean, I, sophomore year, there was a grad school fair at Doherty or something, and I went in and I went straight to Columbia and I said, this is who I am, this is what I want to do. This is you know, what I could do. Tell me exactly what it is that I need to have, what courses, what grades, what internships. I will do it. I want to go to your school. And they said, do you want to do print or broadcast? And I said, print. And they said, go get a job. And they saved me more money <laughs> that I never would have earned back. <laughs> had I, you, know, you don't earn back your journalism degree in journalism. So um, it was great advice. And I'm sure that my first editors wish that I'd had a little bit more professional journalism training before I came in because I was so green. I mean, I just, it's, I, sh I shudder to look back and think about what they, they dealt with. But that was my journalism school. My, my first four years at the Courier Post is where I learned everything. And um, I, I think one of the most important things that I learned, especially covering Washington, and I knew I wanted to go back to Washington. My family's there, and you know that seemed like a great place. I, I'm not quite sure why I ever thought it would be fun to cover the federal government. I go over this quite a bit, like, what made me think that would be good? Um, but I really, I mean, the Washington Post was my hometown paper. And it, we're not a political family. I wasn't really into that. But Washington is, you know, the local thing, even in Northern Virginia, where I grew up. So 
when I first started at The Courier, I'm covering really tiny towns, um, Medford Lakes, New Jersey, which was a vacation town with log cabins that people loved so much. They never left vacation and they you know, made it a, a town where they were. So I would, um, without a GPS, and I, my direction, my sense of direction is terrible. So it's amazing that I found these places. But I would go out at night, and uh, in Medford Lakes, their city council meetings were held in a log cabin. And I mean, it was really, it didn't take long for me to realize that, yes, there are these major things in Washington that impact everyone. I mean, you just, you, healthcare, I mean, absolutely, it touches every single American. But if your trash isn't picked up, I mean, that's the biggest problem in your life. I mean, if it doesn't get picked up every day, and that's a local issue, you know? And so it was so great to learn that. I mean, I'm writing stories about complicated policies in Washington, but it doesn't matter to anyone if their trash is stinking up their yard and, you know, they can't get those services working. So it was just having that perspective, and particularly now working at the Associated Press when, you know, my audience are the people in Medford Lakes, um, and I may not be writing about their public works guys, but. Um, it's good, you know, I know who I'm writing for, I know what's important to them, and it was just, I, I don't know how many people are going to be able to, just because of the state of the industry, go work at a newspaper like The Courier, and The Courier looks very different now than it did when I was there, but it was just, it was just the best experience. So, anyone else? Well, all right, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you.